Um, and uh, I wonder with some of the research and some of the evidence we have that why we shouldn't be do it using golf uh, as an intervention uh, and the golf on prescription. I'll talk about one or two of the examples which hopefully can be copied and uh, we, can, we can start to see to become mainstream and influence policymakers to invest in it. Um, and some takeaway messages. So, um, what in, in sort of 2014, 2015, we were in an odd situation. We're challenging times in the golf industry. We had recessions, we had lower numbers, people worried about uh, to golf club membership. We had growing levels of inactivity. Um, the world knew it. And a world, worldwide epidemic of diabetes and, and, and uh, obesity. We had theoretical anecdotal evidence that golf was sort of good. Oh, I feel great, I just played golf. Oh yeah, you know, it's a middle-aged uh, middle man's sport and uh, all you do is drink and eat too much. Um, that was the sort of impression uh, that, that, that people have at the time. Um, there was no properly evaluated evidence that you could actually stand up. And Tim Fincham used to say, I never talk about golf and health because I'll always get shot down. Uh, and um, I, 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 it's a great story, I tell it every time. I met Tim Fincham for the first time the other day and I said, I always tell that story. He said, I never said it, but it's a good story anyway. We, we need to be able to give our, our, our leaders the evidence so that if they stand up and talk about it, they can, if they get criticized, they can say, well, isn't this published in this, this, that and the other? And, and uh, that was what, um, one of our main aims of the Golf, golf and Health Project. And we also had golf in the Olympics, so we were actually being looked at rather more closely than we were used to. So the project was set up in 2015, funded by the World Golf Foundation. I'm not going to go into how that was done. We have a PhD student, Andrew Murray, who will have finished his PhD soon and will have 30 more years in golf producing evidence uh, along these lines. And he's now just taken over from me as the Chief Medical Officer of the European Tour. Um, we had a number of universities involved, the University of Edinburgh, uh, and, and as you can see, a, an array of universities across the world. And the aim was for publication in leading peer-reviewed international journals. And actually, the, the, I have to say this, I'm the president, I have to declare this. Uh, we own half of the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which has now got the highest impact factor of any of the international journals on, on, on exercise. So I have to declare, I suppose, that I'm going to be a little bit biased. But we need to, in, to, to be able to publish in journals of that, of that ilk for our leaders to be able to stand up and for people to believe it. This is what, you know, I, I, this is what the, the world sees as, 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 um, as, you know, causes of death annually. People will know more about shark attacks than they will do some of these other things. But physical activity is killing about 5.3 5 million. So this is not some sort of little, uh, little problem that we've got uh, in the world at the moment. We've got some common in misconceptions. Inactivity is a small and insignificant risk factor. You need to join a gym to gain the benefits from exercise, and it's all about obesity. Um, and you can bank the health benefits of exercise by playing sport early in life. And I just want to quickly go through this because I want you guys, you know, when someone, when, you're able, when you tell people golf's good for you, I want you to have a theoretical basis and, and some other information which you can give to your friends uh, to, to, to actually um, convince them that you're, that you're, that you're correct. Um, if you look at the other risk factors, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, that's what we think is the traditional risk factors. But low fitness actually is comparable with, with all those. It's not just one add-on that you do when you've done all those other things. It's something you do fundamentally at the beginning. You need to join a, a gym to gain extra exercise. I'm, I'm also going to show a graph. This is death up the side here. This is low fitness, moderate fitness, high fitness. And this was done on 25,000 um, men in the United men and women in the United States. They were followed for a number of years more than that now. And the the thing you can see is that those with low fitness have quite a high risk of death. And if you get them to moderate fitness, that's half an hour's walking on most days. That's like playing a round of golf, perhaps go, uh, a round and a half a week. You get a huge benefit. And actually, when you actually do more intense exercise, 
you only get you gain, gain a little bit. So hang on, isn't golf, you know, perhaps golf could fit into this and, and use this as an argument. So the main benefit of exercise is to get the least fit group into to, to being active. It's not all about joining the gym. But of course everyone says, of course, it, you, you tell us all that, but it, it's all about obesity. That's what the, that's what the risk is all about. Um, certainly there's a lot of it about. You know, if you look from 1985 to 2010, there's a hole in it from the United States. There's a huge amount of obesity about. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not a, a, a risk factor. But if you look at this, this graph again, and, and this, the reds, they're, they're people with, who are overweight. The same relationship occurs between low fitness, moderate fitness, and high fitness. You know, if you take the, the low fit obese group to moderate fitness, they get a much bigger benefit than going from moderate fitness to, to high fitness. But actually, look at the difference between people with no risk factors who are low fit, that's their risk of death, comparing it with one risk factor, obesity, and you'll see that obese people are at risk, but the risk is largely attenuated by being active. So, you know, I, I, I say this to my physi physician colleagues. Um, if you've got someone that comes and said, well, I've been much more active in the last month, but I haven't lost any weight, don't give up necessarily that intervention because it's, it's about being active that actually reduces your risk. And finally, uh, this business about um, playing sport in early life. I used to get uh, patients coming to me and saying, uh, Doc, uh, it's okay, I've played football all my life, I can now sit around, um, I've had all the benefits. You cannot, ben you cannot bank the, 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 um, the health benefits of, of physical activity. Uh, and this is most clearly given by this paper from 2006, which shows that if you actually increase your activity at any point in time, and these are older people, you actually get benefits. This is death on, on the side here again. Um, so if you increase your activity, you reduce your death rate, and if you become more, less and less active, you increase your death rate. So it's worth starting. You know, so if you've got someone in their 50s and 60s and they say, well, I might, might play golf, um, they are gonna actually get a benefit from being more active. Um, and enough of that. Um, and just to say that uh, diabetes is largely preventable, type 2 diabetes is largely preventable by being active uh, and, um, and some weight reduction. But the activity is a highly important and probably the most important part of that, uh, of, of that equation. Uh, it's not all about uh, heart disease, of course, uh, uh, cancer and dementia, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later. But in terms of prevention, physical activity is a significant, perhaps 20% of people with dementia can be, can be prevented by being, by being active. Hey, doesn't, you know, doesn't that sound like golf? Um, we published a scoping rule in, at the end of the first year. You know, we took all the evidence that was out there uh, and we published it in the British Journal of Sports Medicine um, uh, and, um, and, and to sort of state, well, this is what we know. Um, I'm not going to go through some of the details, but we went through about 4,000 papers. We looked closely at about 400. Most of them came from Europe, United States. We're not going to talk about that now. I'm really going to just jump to, 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 to the main messages from there. That uh, golf is a moderately intense physical activity. Now, big deal, what does that mean? But to policymakers, they start to take note if you can prove that your activity is moderately intense because all the benefits they know come as a result of that. And if you look at the compendium of, of physical activity, you'll see golf is a moderately intense physical activity. Um, we found that was there was pretty good evidence that uh, golfers, compared with the general population, do live an extra five years. And that takes into account, because of course this was criticized, and this is why this paper never really hit the headlines, that people assumed it was the class, it was your income, that, that made that difference. But all those things were taken into account. And it's not actually surprising when you take all those other facts which I've told you earlier, that, that we, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by this, 
but there it was. And um, if you look at uh, what happens in Finland, where they don't play any golf in, during the winter at all, and they're very inactive because it's very cold, even colder than BC, I understand. Um, and, and they looked at measures, cholesterol, blood pressure and stuff, and they were all much worse during the winter months. And of course, once they became active, um, they improved. So it, the, there was pretty reasonable um, theoretical reasons why that could be case, the case. And so, um, um, and although there's not good evidence on, on the mental health side, we know that moderate intense physical activity reduces the incidence of, uh, of depression and other mental health disorders. Um, uh, and, and although there's, there's not good evidence for golf on its own, golf amongst a, a, a whole array of other sports has been shown to, to be good preventive for, for mental health. But I suppose what uh, we need to say is that more research is needed. But it's a great start. And we've now, you know, with that publication in that leading, leading journal. What have we identified the gaps? We talked about physical activity. But actually, golf's not just about physical activity, is it? And there are social factors. There's a green space. And, and this is the most incredible paper that, 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 that I've come across in the last few years. You know, I'm a doctor, I suppose I was always looking at cholesterol and blood pressure and, 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 and risk in those, in those terms. But this paper um, looked at a whole group of older people and it looked for risk factors for death over a five year period. And to my surprise, lack of social interaction was the biggest risk factor compared with, you know, in, including high blood pressure, smoking, all the biggest risk factor for death in that five year period. And suddenly I realized that actually, um, you know, perhaps this is, this is something that we should be boasting about uh, in, in the golf world. Uh, and this is something I think we need to talk more about it. I'm not gonna talk about green space, but there's a reasonable evidence that if you exercise in a green space, that you do better and you have better mental health outcomes than you do if you do it um, uh, in, in, in a gym or in a closed space with no sunlight. And you know, we've got no good evidence that, that, that um, we can say for golf in this area, but certainly uh, th th that's something that uh, would be reasonable to, to be researching more in, into the future. The first International Congress on Golf and Health was held last year in, in October. Um, it had three elements, but I'm only going to talk about the, the scientific element because um, what we discovered at the end of the first year was a whole load of gaps. And so what we did was we tried to fill one or two of what we thought were important gaps. Um, we also found lots of work going on around the world that we are able to actually bring together and bring those researchers together uh, and encourage it uh, and encourage publication. Uh, and bring it to the attention of, of the golf world so we could use it. Uh, I say it's propaganda, that sounds bad, doesn't it? It sounds as subversive, but you know, use it as good reasons for why golf should be, uh, be, be, uh, should be being promoted. I said to you that uh, you know, golfers uh, live five years longer. I've told you that I'm not surprised by it. But if you tell policymakers um, that, that someone's going to live five years longer, they're not as happy as you might think they were. <laughs> because they know that it's going to be health costs. I don't really want this in the Vancouver Sun tomorrow, but uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't saying it's necessarily a bad thing. But what I'm saying is that it's about quality of life that we should perhaps be talking about more. Um, and you know, if, if we can say golfers live longer and the quality of life's improved, policymakers are going to love us. And, and we found a, a group in Southampton and a group in, in, in Southern California who, for ages, they've been saying, they've been telling us uh, that, uh, that they thought that, uh, that, that, that the strength and balance that developed in golfers would be protective against falls. And we know that if you, if you demonstrate a reduction in falls, you can actually demonstrate a huge reduction in health costs. And suddenly, policymakers may be, may be more interested. And certainly the, the World Golf Foundation, who funded, funded uh, the, the project, were really interested in, in, in this aspect. And as a result, the, the RNA have funded uh, further studies in California. This was just pilot work up until this time uh, in California and Southampton uh, to actually look into this and to look at groups of golfers, compare it with, with, with controls, and then follow 
people who have never played golf and see whether they develop those characteristics. Bring those two things together and you've got more evidence. Now, there is an alternative. We could actually find twins at birth, divide them up, uh, get half of them to play uh, golf and half not, and 50 years later we could compare the groups, but uh, we found it difficult to get ethical approval for that, and it would be cost about 50 million, 50 million pounds. So this is, the, this is going to be the best possible evidence. Um, I'm also going to talk about uh, the, the Parkinson's disease as well uh, in a moment. Um, it's also a bit of a, at the moment, it's, it's, it, you know, we were a bit ahead of the time because this was, this was published in 2018 in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine saying that we should be looking at um, uh, strength and balance. Uh, uh, we've, we've done to death sort of physical activity, but we should be looking at strength and balance. Uh, and so this was just, uh, uh, you know, this was, this was, we brought to attention of our sponsors to say that we were a bit of the head of the game. So I just thought I'd add that in. Uh, and here we are at the International Congress on Golf and Health, um, and at that um, we talked about strength and balance, uh, and I've, t I've told you all, all about that already, um, and we should have some results by the end of the year. Um, George Salem, Maria Stokes are, are, are the scientists involved. There's, there's uh, uh, George talking at the, at the event. But we also had a very interesting discussion about Parkinson's disease. Now, I think probably most people will know about Parkinson's disease. Uh, they know about the, well, certainly know about the tremor, but the fatigue, the reduced dexterity, um, falls, weakness, and then the psychological stuff here. Uh, and this is something that sort of um, came to our attention because uh, Dr. Anne-Marie uh, Wills from from Harvard, no, no less an institution than Harvard, uh, rang me up one day and said, um, I think my patients do better if they, you know, the, the golfing patients seem to do better. Now that's not causal. You know, she, she knew as a scientist, and she had no interest or no vested interest in golf, she knew that you couldn't say, therefore, golf was good for people with Parkinson's. But she noted that the people with Parkinson's, Parkinson's that happened to play golf seemed to do all right. And she wanted to do a study uh, and she was interested in, in measures of balance, uh, which, which, are, which are quite complex. Uh, and show, so um, she set up a study um, comparing golf with Tai Chi over a 12-week 12, 12 period. Um, in, uh, uh, what she did was that she got volunteers to, to be to, to come in and they would be allocated in, ra at random into the two groups. And she's going to compare those during the summer uh, and we should have some results by the end of the year. So this is perhaps another reason um, why we should be heralding golf uh, as, as a health enhancing physical activity. You'll get a copy of these slides at the end there, and, and it, some of the detail might be of interest to some people, so I'm not going to actually talk about, talk, talk about it all. So um, dementia, we know that this is, this is uh, the scourge of, of, of the 21st century. We know that there are increasing numbers of people uh, that are going to be suffering with dementia. Um, and we know that uh, in the UK, it's been estimated that in each golf club, there are probably 50 people who are developing dementia at any, at any one time. Um, and up until now, we hear horror stories of, of rules violations by people in their sort of late 50s, 60s, 70s, um, only five years later to, to be found to, to be suffering from dementia. And I think it's something that we really have got to bring, to draw to the attention of golf clubs. And I, I've challenged the RNA uh, and the USGA on, on occasions to say that perhaps it's their role to, to actually help draw this out. But I've met someone from Alzheimer's VC Today, I'm hoping we might just do that ourselves because perhaps it's, 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 it's overdue. So we've got to recognize uh, that uh, there are going to be members with dementia. Now, what happens is that, 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 that these people get dementia. They either, well, so, there's evidence that some of them are banned for, for some of the rule violations they're making as part of the early, early symptoms of their disease. Um, but we've really got, for an econ economic reasons, clubs being in their interest, I would have thought, to actually maintain these people and to manage dementia within golf clubs quite easily. 
uh, you know, better than they, they, they are at the present time. Um, and that's um, something that uh, we've, been, we've been talking about. We have had springing up at, uh, in Scotland and at Sawgrass. I went and met, uh, met the people in Sawgrass last week. Memory groups where they bring uh, people um, with interest in certain sports to, to, together to, to, uh, to show photos and to talk about um, uh, their sporting heroes from the past. And golf is, the, is, 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 is a sport that's taken on this challenge. Um, but there are other, um, uh, other work that's, that's happening. And um, I want to talk about the Lincoln Golf Center. This is um, uh, an inspirational chap, Anthony Blackburn, who has brought together people uh, with dementia at a golf club um, in, in, in Lincoln. And he said, well, what, what does he do? Well, he brings people and their carers together early in, early in the morning. They have coffee together. They sit and talk. Um, he's got volunteers from his golf club who he's trained up um, using the local Alzheimer's um, organization to, tr to train them up. Um, the carers then disappear knowing that, that their relatives are in, in good hands for the next two or three hours. And then they do a series of golf-related activities, including some driving, some putting, um, and then they, they go out and walk a hole, and then they uh, play a hole, and then at the end of the morning they come together again um, with the carers who come back. Now, I went along to see this and I wasn't sure what it was going to be like, but talking to the carers, I, I was really, really impressed. Uh, and I'd like to show, if I can, um, a, a video which is perhaps a little longer than, than, than you'd want uh, in the middle of this session, but I think it really captures uh, the value of, of that uh, intervention at a golf club, at a time when there was no one else going to use that golf club, and really extends uh, to what, to what uh, you were saying in the, in the last session, that perhaps this is something. Now we've got the evidence, perhaps, that, that, that golf is good, that's, that, that, that these things should be happening uh, under, under our club system. Um, just before I do that, Falls are a significant risk factor for people with, with dementia. So you see what I mean? It all fit, it started to, to fit together. So if we're trying to convince policymakers to invest in this sort of work, you can see that some of the other work is going to, is going to help with this. Um, and we know that exercise actually is also related to, to, um, uh, to reduce um, cognitive decline. What the relatives said was, that, they, that, that, that on the day that their golf session came up, and it happened every week, absolutely regular as clock, clockwork, so that, they, that everyone could rely on it, rely on it, that those, those people would get out of bed much quicker than they do. They'd walk across the car park to the car much, much quicker. They would get out the cars at the golf club. And at the end of the session, they were going twice as fast walking back to the car. Um, and there was an evaluation done, and of course, you know, our, our, we, we, we want proper evidence for this, and we're encouraging um, the ev that evidence, uh, and that proper evaluations at the present time, and I hope that we'll be able to, in a, you know, a year or two's time, perhaps come back with concrete evidence that policymakers uh, would, would um, take seriously, uh, and, and golf would be seen as a as health enhancing physical activity uh, or a health in um, enhancing activity um, for those with uh, these two conditions I've mentioned today. There are lots of words which you can, which you can um, look uh, when you look at the... Um, the, the uh, told by my, G my GP that golf was over, ex-captain of, of a golf club. These are people that we've that we've seen. He played golf with us every week. Golf was his happy place. This was a description by the, by the carers. Um, this is a, a Alan with, with Alzheimer's. He's no longer with us at the moment. He's 56. Um, you know, he, he played golf every week. He played rugby at a high level. But there was nothing, certainly in the UK, that, uh, that, that could, could compete with this. Um, uh, and uh, his, his uh, carer um, described very, very um, eloquently the, the benefits that that person got. 86-year-old um, man, um, vascular dementia, and you can see the little prizes that, 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 that from the competitions. 
And it, and it wasn't just the physical activity, it was the banter. It was something that they were used to in other sports, and I, I'm, I'm getting a, the, the thumbs up there. It, it's some of the, the normality that the, 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 the sport and golf was able to give to these people that made, made a difference. Uh, and um, Brian, um, who was a cricketer when he was younger, um, never, uh, I don't think he'd, he'd never played golf before, but he came into this, this environment to find it beneficial. So hey, I mean, you know, this is good for golf, this is good for, you know, we, we're good people, we like to, but this is also perhaps a commercial opportunity to use golf um, uh, as, as a health intervention. I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. I'm not even sure I'm going to play this video because I think I've, I've probably, um, looks as I almost did, sorry about that. Um, I think we'll leave that. That's on the, the Golf and Health website and, 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 it, and it goes into a little bit more detail on some of the things I've just said. But I think that, that uh, probably I've, I've said enough and uh, I need to be moving on. So what have we got? We've got, we've got good evidence or we've got growing evidence that uh, golf may be associated with good strength and balance. Um, we await the results of the Parkinson study, um, and we've got some evaluation work to do with people with dementia. But I don't think that should stop us getting on, because I think, uh, I, I think it's uh, an opportunity for, for all uh, to, see, um, to see us um, doing that work in our golf clubs. But the final thing I want to talk about is golf on prescription. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's something that, uh, that happens in, in, in Canada, but I described it at the beginning. People have 12-week blocks of, of time, and if we can tell policymakers and demonstrate to policymakers that we've got good um, physical and mental outcomes uh, from, from playing golf, um, they shouldn't really be able to argue, and especially since uh, the, the evidence so far is that people prefer to go to a golf club environment and they're more likely to maintain their activity. Um, compared with if you introduce, uh, if, if you send them to a gym. Um, the two examples in the UK, one, the England Golf and My Time Active has just won an award, uh, and Dr. Danny Glover, who's not the actor, um, in the north of England, um, who has done it a little bit more scientific, and we, we'll probably get some, some better sort of evidence from him later, later in the year. 12-week programs and they measure strength and balance, physical activity, measures of well-being, social cohesion, and continuance rates. Uh, and they're all looking pretty good. I don't have the results of the evidence so far, so far but, um, uh, but uh, it certainly looks as though it's going to be something that we'll be able to publish. And as I say, then for, 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 pub, for, for um, policymakers to, to take seriously. Um, also at the Congress, we, we had Annika, who's, who's one of our ambassadors, uh, and she, she was brilliant with, with uh, the, the people at the conference and also people in the, in, in the, in the uh, local, local area. And uh, she gave a, a demonstration, and she says some very good things, not just about uh, golf and health, but also women and, women and uh, golf as well. So how do we influence policymakers? Um, this is the final little bit of this. How long, how long have we got? Five more minutes on this? Um, just to say that we did publish a consensus paper. We, we, we got all this evidence together, we identified the gaps, we started to do the work, we attracted people who were doing relevant work in other areas, and we got leaders in golf, players, policymakers together to come up with a consensus statement. And I've got some of the, the outcomes, we've produced some infographics and stuff. And what we're trying to do is to, to, to show those groups how do you maximize the benefits of golf and how do you reduce the risks? Although I've gone on about the benefits, there are some risks of playing golf, but they're, we, they're largely manageable. Um, and we've asked policymakers to look and take golf seriously. Um, and we've asked golfers to, to take sensible precautions, but be reassured that they are, that they are actually doing themselves a, a lot of good by playing golf. Uh, and golf club management, uh, we've given some responsibility to, to, to clubs to um, uh, as I say, to maximize the benefits and to, and to reduce the risk. Um, we published this again in the British Journal of Sports Medicine uh, with a number of, of, of quite high-powered um, people involved, and we came up with some infographics which anyone that's interested could have a copy of here, but they are online with us. Um, the, the, actual, 
the, ISPAR, uh, the, the actual Congress was in three elements. I told you about the scientific bit, but we also um, hijacked, no, hijacked's the wrong word, the ISPAR conference. That's the World Health Authority Physical Activity Conference happens every two years of 1,500 people. And we presented seven papers at that. Um, and we want people to take golf seriously. Up until now, they didn't, because the biggest criticism we had were not inclusive uh, and it costs too much. Um, we then had a London Declaration, which was made in the Houses of Parliament. We thought that would be a good idea if we're trying to influence policymakers. We got uh, the Public Health Minister, who was very keen on, on, on golf and the, uh, and the evidence we presented. We also got Pro Professor Fiona Bull, probably the most important person in world health. She's the professor of, uh, of public health uh, and the leader of the World Health Organization for everything other than uh, communicable diseases. So a highly influential um, phys physician at the World Health Authority. Charlie Foster was the head of ISPAR, that's the International Society of Physical Activity, and Martin Slovers obviously from, from the RNA. Um, and they had a question and answer session within the, within the Houses of Parliament. Um, they welcomed the, 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 the actual consensus um, uh, document uh, and in return we supported the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity and that's a WHO, um, uh, um, it's a WHO initiative aimed at increasing physical activity in, in uh, the world in 2000 and by 2030 by 30% 30 and it was something that we're, we were able to sign up to. Uh, and it's something that I think probably we should all be getting behind because actually it's, it's, it's about growing golf. It's about making people more physically active. We don't want um, uh, 30 million extra people uh, playing golf. That would ruin our Saturday mornings. But, if, uh, but we should be getting behind uh, the fact that people should be, be being more, more active. And I think that's a responsible thing. Uh, there's... Um, Fiona Bull here, this is Andrew Murray, the, 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 our PhD, Martin Slumbers, uh, and this is our, the public health minister, the UK public health minister. And they did a, a session within the, within, within the uh, Houses of Parliament. But Steve Bryan said, growing evidence about the way sport can help those living with long-term conditions such as Parkinson's dementia. This is a UK minister saying publicly uh, good things about, about golf. This is Fiona Bull, head of the WHO. I took up golf in my 30s, but thought it was a very technically expensive and elitist sport. Thankfully, I came along on a, on a come, and try, uh, come and try session and realized that it was enjoyable. Um, also, actually better value. What she also said was that uh, her son, her young son played soccer, and it cost more to, to send the young son to soccer than it was for her to play golf on a, on a Sunday morning. I mean, to have someone of that caliber in the Houses of Parliament saying that, we should, you know, we should be using that, taking to our policymakers uh, in other areas to, to, to show that golf is, uh, is, is useful. Um, and there was a, you know, a large interest in this, you know, six million impressions on, on Twitter, which I'm told is pretty good. I don't really understand totally, but it sounds like a lot. Um, uh, and over 200 sort of repeat publications uh, throughout Europe, uh, and North America, and in Canada, uh, and a host of invitations to, to talk at, uh, at, at various things. So there is a, a bit of a, a momentum about this. Um, uh, and if you go to the Open, you'll see banners um, with some of the stuff. If you go to the Ryder Cup, you'll also look in the program last year, and you'll find a lot of the, lot of the information as well. Uh, and uh, there, there's something just before the Ryder Cup. And, and even the editor, I mention this because Karim Khan's the editor of the British Journal of Sports Medicine, lives and works in Vancouver, and uh, we're very grateful to, to him. Uh, he's really taken golf and, and the, the way we've uh, put science to golf, he's been very appreciative of that and feels that uh, the stuff we're producing is robust um, so we can all stand behind it. Take away. It's official, golf is good for you, but be more confident. You know, when people, you know, start being a bit skeptical about some of the things that you say, have that information about uh, not being able to bank it, uh, that, uh, and some of the information I gave early on in, in the talk. Be confident. Golf managers use the infographic quotes from the WHO and other health leaders when talking to policymakers. You know, use those papers, use the infographics. The infographics are a nice way of illustrating it too. Uh, and you know, perhaps we'll get policymakers to, uh, to listen. Um, and, you know, isn't this an, an inclusion 
issue as well. You know, golf has been s said to be very exclusive. At, at all those congresses and those conferences we go to, the big thing is, oh, golf's not inclusive enough. But actually, if we start to use some of this evidence that we've got here, start to develop programs along the lines that we heard in the last session, plus the evidence-based stuff that, that we will be producing here over the next couple of years, you know, we can have a sport which we could say is probably more inclusive than, than most. Uh, thank you very much for that. But. Sorry about that. Um, I wasn't going to say anything very momentous, to be honest. I was going to hand it over to the USGA agronomist uh, to, 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 to say about the... Uh, but I'm sure we're going to hear that there's, there's lower and lower use of, of, of pesticides. Um, certainly, from the evidence that we've looked at, um, there's no increased risk uh, of playing golf uh, on golf courses, um, but e even 20, 30 years ago when, when pesticides were being used a lot more. I understand now that there is an awful lot less but I sat uh, and answered questions at the global, some global um, health organization, uh, very sort of holistic, um, very green uh, um, group of, of people, uh, and they um, accepted that, uh, that golf was probably not, uh, golfers were not at risk uh, from the use of pesticides on the golf course, certainly in the present day, and no evidence for, uh, in, the, in the last 30 years, that's true. Yes, uh, and um, I got a little bit behind there, um, uh, and I'd like to say that Anthony Blackburn, who I think is, you know, has been inspirational from, from my point of view uh, in his enthusiasm, uh, and he's got manuals, and he's willing to uh, talk to anyone that's interested in setting up these, um, these sorts of systems uh, in, in any golf club anywhere, and um, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. Yeah, um, I'm going to come and talk a little bit more about autism in the in the next um, in the next session. Um, so could I leave that till then? And if I haven't answered your question at the end of it, um, but certainly uh, people with autism um, seem to in enjoy golf. Um, I, I've got an autistic uh, uh, friend who says that he doesn't like the idea of tackling and and competing against people, but he's quite happy to compete against the course. Uh, and it that was one of the reasons why we've we've extended the, neuro, 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 the definition of neurodevelopmental disorders uh, and uh, we'll have autism, uh, people with autism playing uh, with world ranking points. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, if you actually look at the physical activity related to, to using golf carts, it's not actually as 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 little as you might think. Um, and we're doing some work at the moment because the actual act of getting onto a, a, a 
getting on and off um, uh, may be more beneficial than just walking along. We know that uh, osteoporosis is better when you bounce around a bit. And perhaps, um, uh, I, th I think that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. What we've said uh, in these guidance on, on, on um, uh, maximizing the benefits is that when you can, you walk the golf course, but we're not trying to get in the way of, you know, some clubs, they're, they're just built on uh, the need to use golf carts, but we still think there's, there's benefit, uh, but you probably have to do a little bit more of it to get the same benefit as walking. But perhaps there's more to come on that. We've got some stuff in the pipeline. Yeah. I'm Chris's daughter. Oh, right. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> right. I have knowledge of golf after all these years. Of <laughs> Excellent. Be a problem. Yeah. Um, so thank you for this. So I was just going to say it's really refreshing. I'm always really happy to hear dementia being mentioned and being talked about. Um, and I think it behooves all of us to pay attention to this because 70,000 people in BC that we know of have dementia. And you know what we talk about is developing dementia-friendly communities where people who are living with dementia can continue with their regular activities, and golf is a huge one. Mm. And I think it's really important for all of us because, for example, if my dad ever, God forbid, developed dementia, if he couldn't go to his club and wasn't comfortable there and yeah. wasn't able to have his you know, breakfast with the guys, his quality of life would be significantly impacted. You know, and so I think we all, everybody in this room, would probably feel the same way. Um, you know, we're in a position where we can do some training with clubs, and we do dementia friendly <laughs> training um, with lots of organizations if they're interested. And it you know, gives people some confidence in speaking to people with dementia. And you know, we hope to also pass that on also to caregivers, because I talk to caregivers all the time that say, yeah, he used to be a golfer, but he doesn't golf anymore because he doesn't feel like he can. So it's really sort of changing our mindset and, mm -hmm. and knowing that people don't have to do things perfectly, but there's lots of of room so that people can continue to just find that quality yeah. of life and to continue to find meaning in their lives. So. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you for, for the comment. But I, I, I seriously, you know, with, with, with that family history connection now uh, and of what we've talked about today, I think we really could come up with some guidelines to help golf clubs uh, keep people, you know, playing golf and paying their dues because I think that that's a really good incentive. But also, you know, bringing people, other sportsmen, uh, t to the golf course, uh, not playing golf in the traditional sense, but but doing golf ex golf related exercises and being exposed to the banter, which I think is is, is also very important in the green space um, over a period of time. Um, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to show the video. I think it would just, uh, you know, videos go on quite a long time. Um, but it is on the website, and uh, I was moved by, by the carer's description of, of and, and, and how little other services actually mimic that. So we'll talk afterwards. You're going to switch over your... Yeah. Okay. You know, I've, in the last little while, in thinking about this whole subject... Um, I view this subject now as a golfer retention issue and a member retention issue. And, you know, if we can keep people at golf clubs, members of golf clubs for an extra one, two, or three years, um, it not only helps the, uh, the golf courses, but we have the caregivers who leave at the same time that the, uh, that the patient leaves. Um, you know, we have the technology, we have the, uh, the understanding to do it, and I just think that we need to, to think about it in a different way. So I'll turn the floor back over to Dr. Hawks. Right. Um, I seem to have hogged this a bit, but um, I, I, I'm very well aware they've got Darren in, in, in the room, and I think that if there are things that come up, you might even just stand up and, and, and tell me. I, I didn't have too much experience of, of golf for disability um, uh, up until a year ago when I was asked to, to become the director of eligibility classification um, for uh, golf, for Edgar Golf. Um, I'll explain what that means in, in a minute. But uh, I've got people in the room um, who will have 
been involved for many, many years longer than I have. So I'd like you to feel free to, to stand up if I say something which, is, uh, which they don't like, or if they like it, to stand up and say, yep, fine, we've got it right. Um, but um, uh, I, I've been involved in EDGAR. EDGAR is the European Disabled Golf Association. It's not now. It's called EDGAR because it now includes Australia, um, uh, Argentina, uh, and, and North America, um, as, as its members, so clearly it's not European. But it's a bit like the European Eurovision Song Contest. It has all people from all, all around the world. Um, and I was asked to, to, to do this because I suppose I was a, I was a doctor. They, they knew that I knew, and, and they, I was also involved in, um, I knew everyone in golf, and, and that's how I got involved. So It struck me that, uh, that with the work on golf, that, that we've done on golf and health, that actually we needed to become and be seen to be most more inclusive. The biggest criticism, as I said, was the inclusion thing, uh, the inclusion factor, which um, we'd go and give a talk, they'd say, yeah, that's good evidence, but of course golf's not very inclusive, so it's not going to happen, is it, Doc? Uh, and when I was asked to do this role, I thought this was an absolutely excellent opportunity of, of um, bringing it together and showing how golf can be inclusive uh, and I'd like to think that uh, golf could become probably the most inclusive of all sports um, and I hope that you'll get that impression uh, through this talk. I mean if you actually look at the facts and figures one in seven people have a disability that means there must be about 742 million uh, people in Europe, um, 111 million disabled. Golf has a 0.6 percent penetration Therefore, there's probably potentially about 300,000 players within Europe. That should actually get uh, golf club owners uh, sort of interested because, you know, there's a business opportunity uh, here. Um, obviously, you know, why should we have all the fun playing golf uh, when there's a group of people that find it quite difficult to get into golf clubs? It's quite difficult for women. It's quite difficult for people with, who are different to roll up to a golf club and say, I want to play golf. And that's why it's been so... Uh, so refreshing to hear all the sort of ideas that are happening here in, in BC. I'm going to take some of them uh, back to Europe with me. Um, I don't like the idea of calling handy golf and that we're golfers. It's all one, it's one big sport. It should be one big happy family. Uh, and I'm looking at uh, Darren to see what he thinks of this. I didn't talk to him at the, beginning of the, uh, uh, at the beginning of the session. But let's call it golf. Let's not get into, into that. Um, we need to align golf's governance, governance structures, um, uh, i.e. the federations. We need to get uh, people to take responsibility. And I think that's probably what uh, Edgar has been uh, most successful in doing. Uh, Tony, uh, Tony Bennett, who is the leader, who is the chief exec uh, of, um, of Edgar, when he came into post five years ago, said he needed to get the federations to, 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 to take this seriously. He wants Edgar to disappear. He's just providing expertise to federations so that they will take on this uh, and be part of the normal structure of golf. And then the International Golf Federation will become the International uh, Federation, which sets standards, perhaps sets some of the, some of the rules. Um, and then the RNA and the USGA, we need them to come along uh, on the governance, on the rules, uh, on the world handicapping system um, to, to, to finish, it, f finish it off. And I think that's what uh, we've been doing in the last couple of years, is trying to get that uh, into, into place. As a result, actually, the numbers of federations um, have increased dramatically. We started off with, with one or two, and now we're up to 28. I think we're probably up to, to 34, actually, as we speak. So people have sort of come on board. They have accepted that, that's, that that should be the way forward. But there are still disparate groups. Uh, sadly, with all the wars that we've had in recent years, there are a lot of uh, very wealthy organizations, particularly ex-military, um, who do their own thing, uh, and, and, it's, and it's fine. But actually, working together would, would make, it, uh, make it a lot better. And I think the talk of world ranking points, which is I know what I'm, I'm here to talk today, really has helped to, to bring people together. If we say that uh, you've got to, to get world ranking points, you've got to be associated with your federation. 
um, suddenly people start to to um, harmonize and, and play under the same uh, under the same sort of governance arrangements. We also have to set tournament standards that are the same as well. I mean, it doesn't matter, I suppose, if, if, if uh, the groups are playing in their own tournaments and stuff, but it would be, um, I think it would be much easier to grow the game uh, for people with disability if we were all singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, and to set a sort of tournament standards is something else that Edgar's uh, sort of taken on and has done, um, uh, so that to get world ranking points, you have to to sign off to the to to, to the Edgar system of running a t uh, running a tournament. I'll talk about the world ranking point uh, in, in in more detail. Um, we talked about encouraging the IGF. The IGF didn't exist. The International Golf Federation didn't exist until the Olympics. Uh, came, until golf got into the Olympics, and then they sort of administer that area. Um, but they're the natural international federation when it comes to golf for, dis for people with disability. Uh, and they've, they have taken it uh, upon themselves to, to do what a good international federation has done. And they are now employing Tony Bennett, who was with Edgar, uh, and he will be going through the regulations and setting the standards uh, from the center by which the, f the federations can feed uh, and um, uh, which the, 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 the game can grow. Um, the RNA and USGA, as I say, have, have supported the whole system by um, developing world ranking points for players with disability. Now, this is exactly the same system that's used for amateur golf uh, for, for, for people who are not disabled. So it's exactly the same system, but clearly you have to have um, the, the tournaments run in the same way to actually uh, to, to provide meaningful points. <laughs> Uh, and that fits with what I've, which I, what I've said about the, the setting of the tournament. So the world ranking points can be obtained by players um, who have a WR4GD pass. This is the pass by which um, you're able to play in events to get world ranking points. I'll talk about that next. Just before I do, it's also important uh, in the UK... Um, the, the PGA of Great Britain and Ireland have, have CPD to, to actually get their, their golf coaches to um, learn how to, to uh, coach people with disability. In some countries, uh, this is all part of the base learning in the, in, in the base programs. But I think we have got to get the PGAs actually um, taking on and, and um, uh, welcoming um, people with disability and, and being able to confidently teach them so they can enter into this, into this system. Eventually, as I say, I'm just, uh, Edgar will disappear, the, the, the national federations will take over and the international federations. Um, and we need to carry on raising the profile of golf uh, golf for people with disability, and I, I'm, I'm sure people uh, will not have um, missed the fact that at the Australian Open, that's a European tour event in Australia, um, just before Christmas, there were 12 people with disability uh, playing in that event, not just tagged on the end, actually integrated over the last three days into that field, uh, which, you know, which, uh, as far as I was concerned, will probably never happen in any other professional sport. Uh, and uh, it was seen as a, as, a, as a real first. And Golf Australia are, are a very um, active uh, member of our organization. Eligibility uh, and who, who, you know, who is able to play in these events and how do we determine whether, you're, you know, whether, whether, you're, whether you qualify to, to, to play in, in, in these events? Um, as I say, I didn't really know much about uh, disability, uh, golf, and sport, and, and so I spent a lot of the first year actually listening to people and probing. Um, and I was aware that people were being, were being turned away. They were applied to, to, for an Edgar Pass. This was the pass that allowed you to play in Edgar events. And the standard was set so high that some people didn't qualify. So someone would come in and say, look, my government says I'm, uh, I've got a disability, uh, they would, uh, they would they would be assessed for, a, for an Edgar Pass, and they were told, no, you're not disabled enough. You go away. Hey, that was terrible. And that was the very first, uh, first experience I had uh, with, with Edgar. So we've now um, 
well, I'll tell you what we did, did afterwards. We also had a very narrow definition of neurodevelopmental disorders. You just had to have a low IQ and, 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 and some appropriate adaptive behavior. But <laughs> there were people with autism, with Down syndrome, more complex disorders that weren't actually included. And we needed to, to address that. And there was certainly dissatisfaction of, of players with uh, visual impairment, uh, and we really hadn't got that right up until this point, uh, with a number of different organizations actually um, trying to run the system. Um, and of course, suddenly, you know, the, the, the prospect of, of North America coming on board with this, so we're going to have to upscale things pretty, pretty uh, immediately. Um, and at the same time, we had an unsuccessful bid to get into the Paralympics. So there was some very difficult um, situation to, to handle at that time. So we've now devised a path that would be much more inclusive. At the moment, if your government says that you've got a disability and you want to play comp in, in com competitive uh, golf, um, you can apply for an access pass through my, my, my uh, department um, and you will then be able to, to play in tournaments. You have to have a playing handicap, um, and, uh, but that's all you need to, to, to do. That means that, uh, that if you apply for, um, no, hang on, sorry. Um, the new requirement in, in 2000, from, from next year, may be a more international um, standard um, minimum level of, of, of impairment. Um, and this is using a system called profiling, by which uh, players self-declare their, 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 you know, the, the, the nature of their disability. They have a short medical at their first event. Um, and the advantage to us is that we un will understand a little bit more about uh, the conditions that people are, are playing with and will allow us better um, planning for the future. But we're going to have an arbitrary figure of, say, 15% because there's lots of figures associated with this and the computer will s s spew out. But most people will, will be included. Now, we talked earlier, we don't want people with glasses coming along saying they want to play in an in a, in a Edgar tournament. That would be clearly wrong. So you have to have some minimum level of, of, of disability. But with this new system, for, and, and this is the, the we will have uh, an access pass which will allow most people in. We'll have the same equivalent for people with neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. And we'll have the same, oh, eventually we'll have the, a, a similar um, a level for people with visual disability so they can get an access pass and be, uh, and, 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 and be able to play. For those that want to take it more seriously and for those that people want to get world ranking points, they will have a, have a WR4DD pass. I hate this term, but anyway, we'll just use it for the moment. Um, and it, it uses um, the Lebanon categories that are used by the, the uh, IPC to do with strength, tone, range of movement, athetosis, and, and, and using a system uh, of, uh, and, and, and you have to demonstrate that, that this is affecting uh, the golf swing. Uh, there's also an intellectual um, uh, standard as well, and we're using INAS, uh, um, which is an international organization to, to actually um, classify for us. And we're, at the moment, we're talking about visual uh, as being under review because we haven't quite got to the answers yet. Neurodevelopmental disorders, as I say, were very restricted uh, up until recently, just with people with low IQ. They're now going to include people with um, autism, Down syndrome, and more complex disorders. Uh, INAS is the international organization that's going to be doing this for us. The, there are members in, in most countries, uh, and there's an, uh, there's an uh, international uh, agency as well, uh, and they will be um, uh, giving uh, either international or national level classification classification. The national level classification will, will allow you to play in access events. The international uh, level, which is, which is a little bit more cumbersome, it takes a little bit more time, will allow you to have a WR4GD pass. So we'll suddenly have people with neurodevelopmental disorders, many more of them, playing golf at, at, at both those levels. I've said this already. Um, the world ranking points run by the RNA and USGA in exactly the same way as, as the, um, the, the, the amateur uh, standings. 
The tournaments have to ed be Edgar approved. We've clearly got to have standards uh, for how the tournaments run, otherwise it'd be difficult to, to actually to give out points. Um, and the, the next question is, um, what else are we going to need to do? Um, well, it's easy enough talking about these various standards, but we've got to actually have people who are going to do the classification. Uh, and we've got to talk about classification qualifications in North America and training. And we're working on an electronic system which will allow people to apply online, but there will still be a requirement to, to have people um, at events to actually check out on, on people's eligibility. Um, what we've got, the system at the present time is that you apply uh, for either an access pass or a WR4GD pass. The access pass is easy, you just send your government um, proof that you've got a disability. Um, if you want to apply for a WR4GD to get world ranking points, uh, you fill in, uh, fill in a form, it comes to our office, it's looked by our, our head classifier. Um, you'll be expected to see a physiotherapist and, and a physician to add a little bit more detail to that application. Uh, it is then judged uh, and uh, a temporary pass will be given uh, and that will be verified at, at the first event. Um, of course, it means that each event has got to have a classifier uh, attending it and at the moment in North America we haven't got any trained classifiers but we are working with the USGA, the RNA, the IGF to actually create that. I think this is a great um, opportunity to, for golf to show more inclusion uh, at both ends of the game. Um, let's get more people uh, enjoying golf. Um, it's also a, a business opportunity because um, of, of the reasons I've said earlier. And on the horizon, we have the, the planning of various majors. We have the USGA, we have the RNA looking at major events uh, over the next few years. We also have the, uh, the European Tour looking at uh, involving people with disability in European Tour golf events. These are the top players playing in European Tour events uh, this year, next year, and, and in years to come. I don't know if people have heard of M Monique Kaufman, but uh, the, the point I'm going to make here is already made earlier that um, this is a, a lady who played um, table tennis and um, tennis, uh, and tennis um, in the Paralympics, who then discovered uh, golf. Um, she had a Ewing tumor when she was younger and had a spinal cord lesion, um, which meant that she was in a chair. Um, and when I heard her speak, the most like Chris said earlier, the most impressive thing is that she said with the paragolfer, she's able to stand up and hit a ball. And she said that in all her career in table tennis and, and, and tennis, the pinnacle was being able to stand up in a paragolfer and, and hit that ball. Uh, and uh, she's a very inspirational speaker, and if anyone has an opportunity to, to, to uh, meet her, uh, I would suggest uh, that you do. And this man. Um, So what next? Um, I think we've got to be growing the games at both ends. Uh, the elite side is, is important, the world ranking points are important, but I think we've got to get people playing at grassroots. 
We've got opportunity with the, with the system that we've devised in Europe that's spreading around the world to, to actually get people out there uh, playing golf. And we've already heard some, some, some ideas that, uh, that you've got going in BC already, and I hope this will just add to it. Um, I think with a sort of li liberal community, as you've got in BC, I wonder whether you, know, you would like to get involved with some of this stuff that I've talked about uh, today and, and start having events uh, al along the lines that we've said. Uh, and certainly, we would expect uh, players to, to, uh, to apply and get to world ranking points and, and have an opportunity to, to, to play at a high level. Um, We've got to train some national classifiers. We've got to, we're doing a, 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 some sessional work in, um, in Ontario in, in, uh, in August, I think, and uh, if, if there's co collaboration and cooperation between provinces in Canada, I'm not sure what the, what the politics are, perhaps there's an opportunity to, to, to have some physiotherapists, doctors interested to come over and to become qualified national classifiers, uh, which will then allow people to, to have their um, passes verified at the events that they attend. I think we've got to get the International Golf Federation to, to also um, take over some responsibility here. The RNA and the USGA are doing their bit. Uh, we've modified the rules of golf. We've got uh, a new handicapping system com coming on, which will be uh, very helpful. Um, just to say that uh, Edgar, on the 17th, is it the 17th? 17th of April, has an awareness day. Um, so if you're going to play golf on the 17th, or if you're not intending to, please consider it. Sign up on the, on the Edgar website, um, which, which is, and the declaration is that you understand golf is a, uh, is a health-enhancing physical activity, and uh, also highlighting um, the fact that, uh, that uh, um, players with disability should, should be more included and highlight the, the, these developments that are happening uh, in, the, in the world of golf. Thank you. Any questions? They are, yes. Right. I think, I think the thing about golf is that uh, we've got a playing handicap system, which is a great leveller. So for people with access um, uh, passes, uh, that's the sort of lowest minimum level of, 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 um, of disability, they will just join the club and will play with their handicap like everyone else does. Uh, and they, if they choose to do that, that's great. If they play at their own clubs, that's, that's great. But we will be encouraging people to be playing golf. At a higher level, we, we've, we've got to make some, uh, some, some more rules, and you either have a sensory loss, and, and uh, a visual impairment's going to be one, intellectual loss, um, which I've talked about, and, and, and with growing numbers in that area as well. And on the, on the more physical side, um, we use the classification uh, categories used by the IPC, um, and they include limb loss, they include weakness, they include um, lack of range of movement, uh, and we've defined uh, the 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 we've defined these um, uh, levels, uh, and a classifier would then decide whether with, whether someone com uh, is eligible by whether they uh, actually um, conform to the to, to the standard we've set. No, no, there's, at, the, at this moment, we, we, we don't think that's necessary you, because, again, most of those tournaments will be played using a, a, a playing handicap, yes. uh, and it's only at the top level uh, where people uh, play, off, play, play scratch. Uh, and at, uh, at the events that we talked about, the, at the elite end, um, players will be, will, will be playing um, off scratch. And, yes, it's, um, it's not quite the same as the, the IPC see it, but um, I think if we started getting into, you know, plus, 
you know, plus five shots if you've lost an arm at this level, a plus two, you know, it would be so complicated. Uh, and we want this to be a game for golfers. We don't really want para golfers. We don't want to distinguish uh, and, uh, between us and, and anyone else that wants to play golf. It's okay. Thanks, Dr. Hawks. Thank you. Just a couple of things before we, uh, we head to lunch. On April the 17th, British Columbia Golf is uh, partnering with uh, Vancouver Parks and Recreation. We will be doing a media day for uh, golfers with a disability. Dr. Hawks uh, will be meeting with the, uh, uh, with the media. And that whole week after the Masters, April 15th to the 19th, is Golf and Health uh, Week. I would now like to uh, introduce um, a young woman who's been hiding at the uh, back, uh, Maida. Uh, and I'd also ask uh, Michelle Collins to come up at, uh, at this time. Um, we have a little announcement that, uh, that we want to make. Uh, Maida is the uh, uh, managing uh, director of uh, sport cardiology, uh, British Columbia. Michelle is the uh, incoming uh, president of uh, British Columbia Golf. Um, British Columbia Golf and uh, Sport Cardiology BC have uh, just recently formed a uh, partnership which we are delighted to announce today that going forward, um, Sport Cardiology BC will be the official health advisors to British Columbia Golf and they will be contributing articles uh, for our website, for our digital magazine, uh, social media, uh, and they will, in fact, issue a prescription for people to play more golf. So Michelle and Maida, if you could come up. The two of you would. And Maida is absolutely the type of partner that we like because she brought a gift for everyone in the room. Maida. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes of your time, if I may, before everyone heads for lunch. Um, thank you so much for having us here today. It's truly an honor and a privilege to partner with BC Golf, all of you, and everyone that plays golf. Um, as Chris mentioned, we brought a little gift for everyone. So you'll find these little bags at the side table as you exit. Um, you can put your shoes in it, and it's also great for a light ba backpack. And inside we also have um, water bottles for everyone that you can take with you, because we always recommend that you stay um, hydrated during your game. And then we have uh, pens and little um, stickies that go in the back of your phone, so you can put your BC golf cards. Um, and they go at the back of your phone and some pens. Uh, we encourage you to stay active, to stay healthy, and to stay fit. BC Sports Cardiology is here to support all of you and all of the members. If you have any questions, Chris will be also posting some information on the website. But if you have any questions for me directly, I will be standing at the back and happy to answer any questions. So thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your sessions.